everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. I've got a really amazing guest here, new friend, Erin File, who I'm going to introduce. You guys know where you can find me on Dr. Jill Live on YouTube. Uh, please listen, subscribe there. You can also find me on iTunes, Stitcher, or anywhere you listen to a uh, podcast. And today I have an amazing guest. We're going to talk about mindset, but we're gonna, also going to talk about the humanity of when mindset doesn't always work. Um, so super excited to introduce my guest. Erin was introduced by a mutual friend of ours, and we just found out we live like, I don't know, 30 minutes across from each other. So we're going to have coffee hike after this at some point too. I'm super yeah. excited. Um, and she's been a rapid mind transformation expert and founder of the Mind Fix Group. She helps high achievers and entrepreneurs rapidly and effectively clear the biggest mental barriers and challenges holding them back. She's passionate about spreading that message. Contrary to popular belief, real meaningful change of what's not optimal in your life doesn't have to be difficult or take a long time. So Erin, I, first of all, I love story. So I want to hear like, how did you get into this? What's your story? What's your background? Where'd you grow up? Tell us a little bit about you. Sure. So I'm originally from the Bay Area, born and raised. Um, I went to undergrad and got a psychology degree in Washington State. Um, I ended up getting a graduate degree in digital media at the University of Denver. And so I was going towards psychology from a young age, and then I kind of took a veer around the dot-com boom and ended up starting a digital agency and ran that for about 17 years. And what ended up happening is I never in a million years could have imagined I'd be where I am now. I couldn't have planned it even if I tried. But what ended up happening is kind of around year 12, 13 of running this agency, of this consultancy, I just had this knowing that I'm not going to be doing this much longer. I can't. I'm burnt, I'm burnt out. The industry is changing. I need to do something different. And I put all of my effort, this very masculine effort into, I will figure out exactly what's next. I will take the right courses and I will do the worksheets and I will read the books and I will work with the consultants and I will have a plan for what's next in my life. And it, it, it didn't work. Like I just couldn't figure out. I didn't have an answer. And so the universe showed up and one day uh, I was training for a mountain bike stage race. I stepped off my bike and had this little twinge in my left ankle. And within the month, it spread and turned into chronic pain out of nowhere. And so I started seeing, you know, like my PT and then a massage therapist and then an acupuncturist and everybody kind of shrugged. And so I ended up seeing like an orthopedic surgeon and then this specialist and they're shrugging. And one day I'm finding myself in a brain surgeon's office, like everything kept escalating and nobody could figure out what was going on and why this pain was spreading through my body. The x-rays were negative and the MRIs were negative and why not? it wasn't it wasn't, um, it was none of the typical yeah. issues. Um, it wasn't fibromyalgia or anything. And everybody just shrugged and um, I couldn't be active. And so as time went on and like months turned into a year, turned into two years of nobody being able to help me, I started to get very anxious and I started to get very depressed. So not only was I trying to figure out my physical challenges, then I had these mental challenges and I was just shutting down and I, I had to figure something out because I just was, I was miserable and didn't want to be alive. And so I started seeing therapists and coaches and just like with my physical body, like nothing was working. And there was one day I remember I, I talked with one of my mentors and she was like, you know, your whole mental lens of how you see the world and what you believe to be true. It's so skewed and it's keeping you stuck in these loops. And if you don't change that, you're going to be stuck there forever. So that, that kind of got me on the right path, but she didn't have an answer in terms of how to help me change what I had been programmed to believe since I was a kid. So I set off on my own journey for the next year and a half to try and figure that out. And I tried all the modalities. I was like the problem child, like it works for everybody, but not for you. And so I tried like 30, 40 different types of things. And what I ended up doing was piecemealing together these parts and pieces of these different masters of, of people who are doing amazing work. And there's like the work of Morty Lefko and the work of spiritual technology and, and all these different pieces. And I pieced it together into a cohesive program that has an extraordinary success rate that is really consistent. Started changing my life, then changed the lives of the, my friends and those around me. And then it suddenly became a, a business and that's thriving today because we're able to 
really makes such an impact on so many people. Wow. Now that is such a story. And I'm sure that's very abbreviated too for all that you really went through, right? <laughs> like this, yeah. Oh my gosh, I love that. Um, I'd love to hear a few of the different, like you mentioned a few masters, but like some of the, whether NLP or, you know, the kinds of places where you grab these pieces. And what I love mm. about that is, and this is so common to most of us, we talked briefly before, often our biggest struggle, our biggest challenge, the thing that to almost takes us down ends up being the biggest blessing in like the direction of our calling and what yes. we are here on the earth to do. And it, yet it's painful, it's struggle. It's, and I think this is relevant to you guys listening because many of my listeners have chronic illness, Lyme disease, mold illness. We'll get into some of that later, but it's so common to come across some really, and I'm a survivor of breast cancer, Crohn's disease, mold illness. I've had a lot of things too, but those things turned out to be the greatest gift um, in the end. And yet it sucks going through it, right? Yes. Oh, yes. So you went through that really quickly, but what, how did it feel in the, like when you, because what you um, mentioned was so common to many patients when they get shuttled from doctor to doctor to doctor and they don't have the answers and you start to feel like, am I, we call it gaslighting, medical gaslighting, right? So talk a little about that and how it felt, because I know our listeners can relate to that. Oh, I just, I think my, I start to have like shaking and teary eyes thinking about it. Like I haven't thought about that for so long, but my whole body is having like a physical reaction. I'm getting goosebumps. It was one of the more devastating, like long-term experiences because the way I describe it, like when I'm at a conference or I'm giving a talk, the word in the slide that I have in the background is like groundhog's day. It was like, I would wake up and I'd look at my calendar and I'd have maybe three, two, three, four, sometimes five appointments with specialists and experts and professionals and every day I'd go in and I'd be like, this is what I've been told. And they'd look at me and go, I can help. I'm the best. If I can't help you, no one can. And I'd walk out and it would either be a, I don't know what's going on. B, this is all in your head or C, we need to do some 12 month exploratory thing and see if, if we can help you and we'll know in a year. And it was like, we can't help you. It's your, it's all you or we need another $30,000 and we'll try something, but we really don't know if it's going to work. And it was that over and over. Like my calendar was packed wow. every day with these visits and just the sense of hopelessness. And there's nothing different in the cycle. It was, it felt like um, being in a bad dream and just never waking up. Oh, I know so many people can relate. And here I am, like I was a medical student, almost a full-fledged doctor when I got cancer. And as even in the system, knowing the system, knowing how we're taught to think about problems and things, I felt the same way in some, some aspect as far as like, I remember literally with my breast cancer, the boards met and they said, this is what we're going to do. And then I looked at the research and I'm like, there's no increase in survival. Why would I put myself through all those toxic drugs and things? I did end up doing chemotherapy, but the interesting thing was that wasn't the answer as far as just the standard of care. And they didn't really go down to the deep root of like, what caused this? How can we reverse it? the conventional system is trained. And again, I had this training, so I had to kind of go through and overcome some of it, but is to give a diagnosis and that's the end. And even for you, they couldn't even get a diagnosis, right? <laughs> None. I'm still to this day, I never got one. Wow. So you took it up. And what I love in your story is so clear. You are a overcomer. You are a survivor like me and you were bound and determined. Again, I have the same story. Like I'm going to figure this out. I don't care if it kills me. <laughs> and that, that resilience, there's something about that. I always think of Victor Frankl and his work. And he was one of those people like, I cannot imagine the suffering of some of those people who've written and yet they take it and they pull out these things that are so valuable to us that come after. And that's what you've done. You've taken this tragedy, this difficulty and pulled out all these pieces and created a new. So tell us more about like, where did you get the mindset work and what is, what do you do with people now? Like, what do you, how do you take them through that? Yeah. So it's interesting because, you know, I said, we have this great success rate, but part of why we do is we are so clear about who we work with. Um, one of the things that we have found is that the people who see the most success and who are able to rapidly transform, change their lives, improve things that have been challenging or difficult for years, sometimes multiple decades, are the people who we say have more of the internal locus of control. And so these are the people who are the opposite of victim mindset, um, who are like, you know what, I understand that if I take ownership and I change my life, 
then everything around me changes. My relationships change. There's a ripple effect out. How I see the world changes. I'll make different decisions. I'll feel different as I go about my day, but it has to start with me. And that's in contrast to say some of the people who are like, when I'm, they may call and they're like, here's my problem. It's my wife, you know, and it's like, it's my kids, it's my employees. And it's all these things outside and the world is bad and life is bad and things happen to me. We find that it's very difficult for us to make help someone like that shift because everything happens to them. But the people who are like, I know that if I can change and improve and alter kind of how I'm seeing the world in my mental lens, so much is possible for them. Does that make sense? Oh my goodness. That makes so much sense. Again, it's like the, the Victor Frankl's of the world. They showed us decades ago because they took the most devastating thing in the world and they knew that they still had control. In fact, some of his favorite, my favorite quotes of him are, no matter what anyone does to you, you still have control of your mind and your thoughts and your, so that fits so well and so true. So what do you, first of all, you obviously you choose carefully of, of the kind of people that you know are going to be successful. That makes yeah, sense. I feel like I didn't answer your question. You started to ask and I wanted to tell this other thing. That's so okay. No, I, I won't. won't yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, we can go into what you do, but the first of all, that, that's actually really important. What would you say if someone's like, oh, everything's happening to me? You might say, come back. This isn't the right thing for you. But do you have any advice for someone who's stuck in the victim mentality? Because that's a big deal to switch over. It's, it's hard. Um, it's, we have found some that oftentimes the people who are in that aren't open to changing. They aren't open to advice and they aren't even open to suggestions when we've given them next steps to like, you maybe explore this and then come back. There's interestingly enough, oftentimes when people have that victim mindset, it's like, it doesn't matter what happens anyway, or what I'm going to do. There's this helplessness. So doing something about it or exploring options oftentimes isn't even appealing to them. So I have yet to find, I'm sure there are people out there who specialize in it, but we have yet to find things that are really effective for people who are stuck in that Mm -hmm. mindset. And they typically don't seek us out to begin with because it's like, you can't change all the bad things that are happening. Right. Right. So that, well, that makes sense though, because you screen carefully for the people who are going to be successful. So with those people who are I want to do whatever I need to do. I know it's all about me. I can change my attitude. What do you, where do you start? What do you do? And I also did want to know, like, where, where have been some of your biggest influences? Cause you went and sought places all over the place. Um, yeah. Tell us more about. Uh, that. Sure. I would say oh, we've had so many influences. Um, definitely. It started with the work of Morty Lefko and belief work. Mm-hmm. Um, he passed away several years ago, but his wife is still doing a lot of uh, that work. And um, I learned a lot from her. We've also integrated a lot of IFS and internal family systems in the work, uh, work in the work of Barry Schwartz to really enhance that. Um, so for a while, we, here. I, I know. What's I know that? So real quick pause. I, I've heard of internal family systems. I know what you're talking about. For someone who doesn't know what that means, what would be like a brief description of what? Yeah, it's so beautiful. I, I We did an introduction at one, a live event a couple of weeks ago to this. So if I, if you're in an argument with your spouse and you're like, I hate you, right? I just hate you. That is so violent and hard for someone to hear. And it shuts things down, but you want to honor your anger. Now, if you honor that we as humans are made up of many parts, that it's not just me and I feel this way, but if, if that communication is, there's a part of me right now that is so angry There's a part of me that loves you. And there's a part of me that wants to work this out. But when we acknowledge we have different parts that have different goals, different desires, different emotions, different feelings, different fears, we can be like, there's a part of me right now. That's very angry. There's a part of me right now. That's very tender and still loves you and is hopeful. And there's a part we can actually talk with and address the needs of different parts of us. And so much of our confusion is we feel broken and it's like, well, I'm being pulled in different directions. It's like, there's a part of you that wants to move forward. And there's a part of you that wants to hide. And when you work with parts and the unique parts, and then you take some of the really powerful modalities out there that don't work for people, but you do it within the context of working on individual parts, suddenly some of these tools and methods out there that didn't work for people suddenly work really well, because instead of trying to work on, I don't really know how I feel. You can work in a really clear manner with the different parts of you. Oh, that makes so much sense. Cause so often we have a goal, we want to get there, but there's a part of us that's sabotaging, right? Because we're afraid of success or we're afraid of whatever X, Y, Z. 
Um, love that. Thank you for describing. So that's a huge influence. Is there any other pieces that you've worked into your program? What's that? Is there any other influences for the work? Gosh, that you do that are there's so many. I mean, we have seven different types of sessions. Um, we've worked, uh, sometimes we work in the world of metaphor and we've followed the work of John Connolly who does rapid transformation therapy and we've blended some of his work in. We've done um, uh, some of our uh, explorative processes integrate um, like conscious conversational hypnosis elements into them where it's it's more of a conversation or clear language so it's all about how you ask the questions and exploring the concept of metaphor there's little elements of like inner child work that's woven in but just little parts and pieces that at the right time can make a big difference um, for a while we worked with Mike Parker over in um, Wales and he did uh, liminal coaching and liminal work so addressing kind of the part of us that needs to be in in like the drift state in between the conscious and the subconscious world we have done um, we integrated some of the work of cellular release therapies and I'm just trying to think of like all the different that, yeah, pieces. Pro progressive, progressive mental alignment. Some of our clients have, you know, um, unresolved or, or memories that can't be uh, accessed. And we that that's really big over in the Netherlands right now. It hasn't been so big in the United States, but we have someone on our team and we blend some of that work into it. Um, we explore some of the cutting edge world of, of psychedelics for some of our clients and integrating how that can be supportive in a way. And um, I feel like I'm missing a bunch, but we have about like 10 to 15 different elements, including some somatic experiencing and some somatic therapy and blending it all into a really beautiful program that started from just a couple methods and now has expanded into this really cohesive, what does someone need? Um, and then kind of tailoring it. it. So you kind of have this like a smorgasbord of different things and access to lots of different tools in your toolbox. Totally get that. I do the same thing, but yeah. you, your client, you kind of assess them and say, where could they use the most help? And then kind of give them those options. That makes perfect sense. So yeah, we have, possible, yeah. we have a few, like three main packages and then, but because I speak with everyone, I'm able to either customize them or tailor them or kind of tweak things so that it'll be the best fit for them. Wow. So I can see this question being real interesting. Like how did your experience allow you to be so good at what you do? Because you clearly like had this, like, how, how did that fit together? Cause I can see you're really good. And also <laughs> probably from some of the bad experiences, right? <laughs> the only reason that mind fix the mind fix group exists today is because almost nothing worked for me, but I could see how it, things could work for other people. And I had this sense of what, when things could be combined in different ways, how it could be exponentially more powerful. Um, and going through so much, like if you look back over the last 10 years of my life, like the, the number of traumas and the amount of life situations, like many of many people go through one or two in their lives. And I went through almost all of them, you know, in the course of like five years. And so I have so much empathy and understanding when someone comes in and they're like, you know, I've been through the chronic pain thing or someone comes in and it's like, no one can help me. Or mm -hmm. I have the worst inner critic you've ever heard that's screaming at me. I'm like, yep, yep, yep. And I understand. And I instantly have that empathy and know like that there's a path out and people can connect with that and know that I'm not just making it up that I've been there. I've lived it. I get where you are and I've seen how you can get to point B and you don't have to stay there. And I think that helps me connect with people, build appropriate plans, and then just, just have true empathy for my fellow humans too. Oh, I, I love hearing that so much because it's um, so, so similar in my path. I finally realized I was the divine head. I was a guinea pig, right? So we're like, and the thing is with true healers, which you are, it's like this in this way, we often do experiential learning. And for me, I had to learn the hard way. That was how my best learning comes. Medical school was great, but <laughs> the true learning came from that experiential component. And then, like you said, I can sit there in medical school where we were taught to be like, have this wall and, you know, we don't get, we don't cry with a patient or we don't do this. We don't like, like even the empathy was, I almost, as I'm writing my book, I talk about like how we were almost, um, 
trained out of us that empathy. Now, granted, that's like the wrong way, I think, to practice medicine or do any sort of work. But it's interesting because what really does come that true empathy when we have been there, we can say, I totally get where you're at, that human to human experience. So I, um, kudos to you because you had to go, I know you had to go through a lot to get there, but what a beautiful thing to use that to really connect with people. And it's, it kind of stinks, but it also now that we're doing what we're doing. So it's something we talked about at the beginning before we got on here that I want to address because I have so many listeners that can relate. You and I both have a little bit of experience with mold. And the thing that we talked about, and I really want to hear your perspective was you, and I say this on lectures too, I'm sure you do when you're teaching, you can be completely well adjusted, have done all the therapy in the world, have a great mindset. You can have great family systems. All these things can be in place. And that mold toxin is so nasty on the limbic system that it can blow you out of the water and you don't have the resources to deal with it. Talk a little about your experience and I'll share mine too and how mold can be so nasty and it can really sabotage all of these beautiful things that you've done um, and know how to do. I mean, I was diagnosed with major depressive disorder as a teenager and dealt with depression for much of my life and thought that that was just one of the worst things ever. When uh, now knowing like kind of when I started to experience the mold toxicity, the mold toxicity amplified my severe depression, probably times 10 Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then added layers of debilitating anxiety on top of it. I'd never experienced anything like it in my life. It took everything that I thought I knew and just ramped it up a hundred times, um, And all so many of the people that I've talked about, it's like, I had to shut down my business. I had to stop driving. I couldn't be in light. I couldn't talk anymore. So somehow I was able to continue growing my business, but that was like all I could do. I I couldn't, I couldn't do anything else. I lost relationship. I lost my primary relationship in my life. I lost three business communities. I lost my um, primary like social group and social community. I was told I was too negative. I was told I was too sad. I was told I was too heavy. And here I am supposed to be the founder of a mindset company. And I'm facilitating the transformation of all these uh, people out there. And yet I'd be sitting at home on the couch, riddled by panic and terror. And my brain's like, you're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. I'm like, I am? Why? What's happened? Like, (laughs) is there someone? It's like, It was almost as if there was a burglar in the house or I heard a gun and I was having that kind of reaction throughout the day. And I didn't know why. And I done, I did so much mind work. There were no stories left. There was no stories going on in my mind, but my body was having a reaction that made me feel like I wasn't going to be okay. And that everything was going to fall apart with no story attached. Um, it was the most debilitating, terrifying experience. So here I am going, no, I'm just going to live my life. And I'm trying to go to conferences or events and I'm having to leave in the middle and go cry in a back room. And I don't have a reason why there's nothing wrong. Right. And I'm just like, I don't know what's happening. And I'm getting, you know, hormones checked and everything looks kind of blood work seems relatively normal. And so I'm again, being told everything's normal with you. It must be in your head. Yeah. And that advice, it must be in your head as a mindset, you know, person, I started to doubt, like, do I not know my stuff? Yeah. Yeah. And it turns out it was actually in my body and my brain and my nervous system. And it wasn't actually in my mind. And it wasn't until I figured that out and started to clear out the mold. And there, and that even took me a while to figure out the best way for me that was the only thing that allowed all the work that I had done to actually lock into place. Wow. What a story. And I love what you said, because it it really, I would say 100% of patients I treat for mold related illness. And I do a lot of that nowadays. (laughs) Somehow I accidentally became the mold expert. So, but um, what, what I saw, heard in your story, that's so relevant. And now I've looked in the research, it's in the literature over and over this chemical limbic activation. So you can, like you said, you can have all the knowledge, all the, uh, you've done all your work. You don't have any stories, but that chemical, and it can be toxic chemicals, but mold is probably one of the worst goes right into our nose, into our um, hypothalamus through the cribriform plate. And there is literally a chemical reaction, hypothalamic to the limbic system, causing that whole fear. So what it feels like is if we were just scared by a lion or tiger, like you're sitting in your house 
but it's a chemical uh, trigger and it's literally like mapped out. This is in the research. There's no question that that chemical triggers. And I went for years trying to figure out like, why do people, granted, there's a lot of people who have stuff they need to work on and everything, but there's a lot of people who are very, very conscious and aware and they've done their work and they get mold. And even my own experience, same thing. There was this trauma loop. There's this trauma response. And I was like, how does that fit? But I realized it's not, it's a chemical trauma response. So just like we have a physical scare or a um, childhood trauma or memories, this is literally the chemical triggers that same limbic loop. So what you said is so relevant. And I'm sure listeners, you've experienced this as well. And I have as well, where there's this fear and some people get stuck in it where they can't even live in a home or they're afraid to be, because it literally, whenever you smell or, or get an exposure to mold again, it re-triggers that trauma. So you go into that fear response right? It's just so real. Mm -hmm. But most doctors don't know that mold is not just an allergy. <laughs> so it's like, oh, this is like you said, the all in your head. And that makes it just worse because you're like, oh, I don't think. And so we start to doubt for me, part of the learning was I really doubted myself and my ability to know what was true and right and good and the direction to go. So I started um, outsourcing to other people. And when we are in, in that mode and we're outsourcing, especially to doctors who all tell you you're crazy, you start to believe it, right? Because you're like, well, everybody says this is all in my head. It must be. So uh, how did you get out of that then? And how long has it been since you've gone through kind of yeah, I got my diagnosis um, the third week of October last year and started like a protocol of uh, first had the, the mold remediated from the property where I was at. I've since moved a few weeks ago. I told you I moved and um, and then started uh, because it had impacted leaky gut and then have brain autoimmunity and all the things that come along with it. Um, started a different, you know, a rotation AIP diet and then tons of supplementation. It didn't really help for a while. Um, for uh, three months, uh, my life, I would say, um, what saved my life was, was combo was actually doing, um, a combos. I did a trip, uh, four combo ceremonies over one weekend wow. and wow. within three or four days, suddenly the brain, the debilitating brain fog that I had cleared for the first time. I remember having my first positive thought in like a year, like things are going to be great. And I was like, Oh, hi. you know, like <laughs> that part of my brain just came back on and it went away. But it was just like, Oh, things, things are coming back. I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. And, um, and so since then I've been, I've done another couple ceremonies and I've since been microdosing um, one to three times a week. And that has just kept everything getting better and better and better to where I'm feeling more and more and more like my normal self again. Oh, yeah. It takes a while. It's just a process. I totally remember. Oh, mm -hmm. amazing story and all that you've been through. And I, like I said, I love that we can both talk about, I think before we get on, I mentioned this too. I was sharing just last weekend with physicians and I was actually sharing, I don't do this a lot, but these images of me at the sickest with the mold where I had acne and scarring and I lost all my eyelashes and rashes. And, and I was telling them, you know, I remember in the midst of the worst of it, where I literally sat in my car and cried and I'm like, I can't go out there. I'm supposed to know how to peel people. And you like mindset, you're this expert. And when we get, when we hit our humanity and our own blocks, first of all, we learn a lot from them, but there's also this shame, this shame around like feeling like we should know the answers. This should work. And sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> and I remember being in that spot in my sickest where I was just afraid to be even seen. Like I was so felt like I was so sick and so like not a healer. Um, but it was yeah. so precious because everybody in that room could relate any of us. We all have our areas where we don't have it all fixed or all together whether you're a healer or a patient or doing any sort of job. And I love that we're both so honest about that because it's very, very real. And I think there's a lot of shame around feeling like we're an imposter. It doesn't mean that it's just more learning <laughs> through those experiences. Yeah, absolutely. So um, tell us more about what do you offer? What are you doing? What kind of programs do you have? Uh, Cause I love, love what you're doing. And is it mostly online or in person or how does that work? Yeah. So 98% of the work that we do is virtual. It's online. We have a handful of different programs right now. Everything is private and one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. The work that we do is not like teaching or coaching or therapy. Everything is more like um, 
we're like surgeons. So you come in with a lot of pain and we're going to pull out the splinters so that you can heal up and there's nothing left to cope with or deal with or manage. You just go back out without the pain and without the splinters, without anything to that you have to keep repeating um, try, as you try to heal. Mm -hmm. So because of that, everything we do is private one-on-one -on -one programs. We have a few different tiers. Um, it's a bit like a Mayo Clinic for the mind. So no matter what program you're in, you, you typically have a group of our coaches and a program manager and me kind of managing your, your case throughout the, your whole um, experience. Most of our programs are three to four months. The longest someone works with us is six months. So we don't have the, you're going to work with us for the long term. We don't have continuation programs. You come in, we're going to find the root cause of what's going on. We're going to clear it. And we're going to send you back out to be an amazing human. Um, we offer four quarterly private events for people who are interested in really pushing their comfort zone and having an incredible kind of once in a lifetime experience. They're typically held in Colorado, but that's the only opportunity to kind of work with us and, and be in, in person. So yeah, so we have our private programs and our quarterly events. I love that. And, you know, it's interesting because the classical therapy, like we learned in medical school, cognitive behavioral therapy, you go back every week and talk about the same things over and over and over again. And for most things, it doesn't work well. There are certain indications for that granted, and there's experts. So I hope I'm not over speaking, but what I found personally like you is the work that really worked for me was these things where I had a session and something cleared and it was never there again. It was gone just like a splinter. Yes. I dealt with that piece of my childhood. I dealt with that piece of how I was thinking and it shifted. And then I came out of that hour session or two hour session and I was a different human from that day on. So I mm -hmm. love that you're saying that because that somatic based work typically works that way where you really shift. And if you aren't shifting, you need a new therapist, <laughs> right? Exactly. Exactly. need a new program. So really appreciate that you mentioned that because I think so. my personal experience is the same way. The most powerful work I've done has been transformational in the moment. And then you never, in fact, you almost forget that you were like, there's some things that I look back, like the kind of relationships I dated some really yeah. rough thing, you know, I won't talk about that here, but, um, and I was like, I can't even imagine that girl. Like, how could she think that way or do that thing? Because I shifted the mindset, the trauma that was driving that. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And then, but to speak also to one of the points that you just made, you're like, if it's not working, you probably need like a different therapist or a different coach. One of the things that we, we learned the hard way a lot from my personal experience. And then from the experiences, some of the clients that we had to refund over the initial years in business is that if you have a dysregulated, severely dysregulated nervous system, and if there are things going on somatically in your body and you don't have a base feeling of being safe, in, in yourself, mind work, it's not the next step for you in the sequence. You really have to start with a regulated nervous system and basic body health. Mm -hmm. um, like for me to try and do mind work when I was in the middle of mold, yeah. it was fruitless. Yeah. And nobody told me that. And we've had people who had such dis nervous system dysregulation and are going into dorsal vagal freeze loops that they yeah. can't process in their mind isn't there. So if something's not working or nothing's working, it is possible you need to pause and take a step back and manage your, regulate your nervous system before you do some of the more kind of um, mind work that can be so powerful, but only when it's in, done in the right kind of order and sequencing. I love that you're saying that because as a functional medicine doctor, same exact thing when I have someone with mold or chronic illness of any type, we have to go to that limbic system. Like we talked about that activation. And we have to, I love the image of safety because often like even mast cell activation, which is usually the second thing we have to deal with. That's basically when the mast cells react to everything in the environment. But at the core, there's a piece of that where the body's not safe and it can be on a chemical physical level, but it can also be an emotional mental level. So I, even though I am not a psychiatrist or anyone in that realm, um, and I refer out to people more like yourself or your program or other people who know what they're doing, I can recognize at least when my patients are in a place where they're not safe. And they may have mm -hmm. like, again, physically or in relationship it can be safe, but their mind and body feel unsafe. And it can be an old story, an old childhood pattern. But I love that you mentioned that because that's really where we start. Both of us is finding them a place where they can start to feel safe in their own body. And that's Absolutely. what you're saying. Yeah. I love that. Wow. Amazing. So where can people find you? What's your website? Um, where can I'll put yeah. some links in? Um, here. Sure. So the, the easiest way 
for someone to learn more about the work that we do is just to go to our website, which is mindfixgroup.com. And if people are short on time, I recommend they go straight to the results page. So it's forward slash results, or you can click the results button at the top and you can scroll down that page. It's like four and a half miles long. We, we we're at a point where we don't even know if we should keep updating it because it's just taking so long to load, but it's where we share the, what people have experienced when they go through our work so that others out there who were like me five, six years ago, seven years ago, can start to have hope that change is possible, that even if they've been stuck or their issues that they think are different than everybody else's, I, we want people to at least go there and see what's possible from just real normal people like you and I. So the website is definitely the easiest way to find out about our work. If someone's on Facebook, they can look me up and friend me. I'm, I often share kind of case studies and ideas and things on my personal Facebook page too. Awesome. So I will share those links. I actually just put them in if you're listening here today. Um, Erin, awesome. What any last bits of advice? Um, you've been through a lot and say someone out there is suffering in the middle of mold or getting through that or feeling like maybe, I, you know, I can't overcome this, but I want to and I'm willing to do the work. What would you tell them? What would you tell them? <laughs> I have. Well, number one, it's look into combo. It truly saved my life um, and kind of fast tracked me back towards health. That, that's the one thing I invite people to research to see if it would be a good fit for them. Number two, if people are trying mind work and nothing seems to be working, um, double check that you're working with someone who specializes in uh, rapid transformation or is working with like newer mind technologies versus kind of some of the old school CBT long-term, it takes massive repetition yes. um, to, yes. to change anything because that's definitely more of an old school way of thinking that's not required anymore. And then um, also if, if nothing seems to be working with your mind, definitely take a step back and work with someone like you to examine what's going on somatically and in the body and in the nervous system to make sure that there's a proper foundation for you to be able to take advantage of and leverage mind work. Mm, perfect. Beautiful advice. I couldn't agree more because um, even with me, I'm always, I do the medical side, but I often need people like you or other programs because that piece of the mindset and those changes, they correlate so well with healing. Um, Aaron, what a treat to meet you. And since we're neighbors, we're going to have to connect again soon. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you.